We've all purchased motor oil, but do we really know what's in the bottle? I'm Gail Banks, and in this episode, we're going to learn all about motor oil chemistry. It's time for Speed School. In the last episode, I learned how motor oil is manufactured. Today, Dan Peterson from Amsoil's engineering department gives me a chemistry lesson. It's day two of my lubrication education. Welcome to the Amsoil Chemistry Lab. This is kind of the brain truss of Amsoil. And uh, we're going to be taking a tour today of the whole lab and we're going to see all the things that we're doing. Yes. But before we get started, I'd like to take your viewers through some foundations of how a motor oil is put together and some of the components and how they work. So we're going to take a look at that here before we get going on the tour. Well, I'm here to learn. All right. Yeah. This picture represents what a lot of people probably understand. You got a, a rolling uh, shaft here, and then you've got a bearing surface. Mm -hmm. So one of the primary roles of a lubricant, first of all, is to separate surfaces. Yes. So one of the things that we really spend a lot of time on is viscosity of the oil or the thickness of the oil. The thickness of the oil makes a big difference in terms of the deflection of these surfaces. So this bearing, being a softer material, actually does a little micro deflection right here. Ah. And that's created by the oil. And uh, the viscosity of the oil, you know, impacts that. Yes. So the primary role then is separating those surfaces. A lot of people think about, well, thicker is better, right? Yes. Thicker is going to create more surface separation. That's true. Mm -hmm. But what also happens when you go after a thicker oil is you get into more energy required to then pump that oil around to all of the places that need to be lubricated. So that would be a parasitic loss. Parasitic loss. Yep. And it would result in a loss of power mm -hmm. and fuel economy. So in this process, this would be termed wedging? Yeah, there's a little yeah. eddy created right here as the oil enters that nip and spits some out, and then the oil that remains then goes right through the nip and then takes care of uh, separation Is of this the, the beginning of the high viscosity parasitic loss? That yeah, we're talking about? And, and this eddy would be very much larger. As the viscosity goes yeah. out. Yeah, so say this was a 30 weight oil. If we went to a 50 weight oil, it would be a very big eddy current and, and it, it would be rejected out of the nip. So a lot of guys go to heavier and heavier, thicker. Mm -hmm. uh, Thinking they're helping themselves. Exactly. And they really aren't with a correctly formulated oil. The correct viscosity is what we're talking about here for the job. Here's the message. You don't want to over viscosity the requirement. The wedging, the heat produced right there and through this gap increases with the viscosity. So your oil temp increases as a function of Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Oil temp yeah. would go shooting up with a much thicker viscosity than is required by the application. And different applications are built for different viscosities. Yes. That's why we have everything from a 020 up to a 1540. Yeah, I've noticed you guys not only have a range of its viscosities, but going through that central warehouse, the range of products, application specific oh, yeah. products seems to, to be your strength here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if there's a, a specific need for lubrication, we're pretty much making the product for gotcha. it. And they all require different things in terms of chemistry, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, and thickness and different types of base oils. All right, the next thing we're gonna talk about I know your viewers are asking about what's the difference between a synthetic and a conventional yes. product. That, we get that question all the time here at Amsoil. It says base oil. Th this is what you start with and then you package it. In other words, you do the additive blend to do the specified job, which is stated on the box. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually saw a lot of these uh, uh, base oils in tankers you know, out on our, on the tour. So this is uh, just a list of base oil categories. Gotcha. So this is the start of defining the difference between conventional and synthetic fluids. So we're gonna start with what's called a group one fluid. So this is a typical conventional fluid and this is how it's specified. 
So when you get a conventional motor oil, it would contain some group one and, and probably group two fluids. Yes. So this, that's just the name of the fluid type. This is the manufacturing process that it goes through. It's a lot of chemical refining, just plain chemical refining mm -hmm. to alter those molecules and clean them up a little bit. So not a huge amount of work, but some work that's done on it. So the oil that comes out of the ground. Right, coming right out of the ground. Has stuff in it you don't want. Right, there's plenty yeah. of things that are, are taken out of a barrel of oil, but when you get down to working on the base oil, there's yes. still a lot of contaminants that come with it that we don't want, mm -hmm. ineffective uh, molecules that are in there. So it's chemically refined yes. and to change that. So this next one is saturate level. So this one we're gonna talk about in a minute, mm -hmm. but this one has a lot to do with oxidation resistance. So it's um, either a lower amount of saturation, which is, is not good, or a very high amount of saturation, and we'll go through that in, in a minute. So now we're going to sulfur level. Sulfur is a typical contaminant, and it yes. comes out of the ground and you get a stinky barrel of oil, right? Yes. And you can get sweet yes. crude or sour crude, you know, it's got more sulfur. You so know, you're smelling it. hydrogen sulfide? You're, yeah, you're smelling the sulfur content yeah. in that uh, and it does carry through, you know, so there is an amount of sulfur that we don't want in, um, in that base oil that yes. comes in that we take a look at. And you don't want it in your diesel fuel either. Right. So we're taking a look at uh, the sulfur level and defining that um, mm -hmm. and, and basically trying to get more sulfur out of there. So group one has a fair amount of sulfur in it. Now I'm going to move to viscosity index. Yes. So this is kind of a complicated one, Gail, but it's very important for, I think, the viewers, you know, to understand. So viscosity index is just the relationship between the thickness at a cold temperature mm -hmm. of that base oil mm -hmm. and the thickness at a high temperature of that same base oil. So, so the range is minus 30 C? Well, this is one that we actually create a curve on and there's ah, no specific range for it. Gotcha. It's just the relationship between what it looks like at cold temperatures versus what it looks like at hot temperatures. So you get this kind of negative curve going on where it's really thick at cold temperatures and it gets thinner at hot temperatures. So the big difference is as we go up the scale to higher quality base oils, yes. the viscosity index goes up, meaning that we don't get near the amount of change in thickness at cold temperatures versus hot temperatures. Yes. So that curve like this starts to flatten, flatten out, out a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. this would be a conventional molecule and the synthetic would flatten out kind of mm -hmm. like this. Less that's a, delta. That's a huge advantage. Yeah, because you think you start up your engine in cold temperatures. Yes. Uh, you don't want it to be lugging and have a, you know take a long time to warm up and take a long time to get that oil up to where it needs to be to lubricate things. And then uh, opposite, uh, in hot temperatures, you want to make sure that that thickness is good. You got a good thick oil at hot temperatures where you're needing to protect things. So, cold start engine wear. Big one. Yeah. Some people estimate it's over 50% of all wear in an engine, cold starts. I, I'm one of those people. Yeah. Now we're going to go to a little bit more refining. So this yes. is hydro processing and more refining. So you're starting to attach some, uh, some uh, hydrogen molecules onto that base oil molecule and get rid of these free radicals that are in there and double and, and triple bonds. We'll talk about in a minute. So more hydro processing and some more chemical refining. That brings the saturate levels up a little bit. So then the requirement, you have to be above 90% on that saturate level. And, and the higher, higher is better for saturating the molecule. You start to get your sulfur levels down yes. below 0.03%. So you're getting more contaminants out of the system. And then look at uh, the viscosity index. It b basically remains the same over here between a, a group one and a group two. So they're generally that 80 to 120 level. So you don't get to um, better viscosity index until you get to group three. So now group three, Gale, this is where we get into synthetics. Yes. So we didn't define this. Um, there was a, uh, an industry uh, dispute uh, <laughs> several years ago where one base oil manufacturer was making group three base oils and they wanted to define group three base oils as synthetic. They end up winning that argument. So group three base oils are still base oils that come out of the ground, but they're so highly refined de-waxed yes. and uh, hydro-processed that we get up, you know, way above 90% for the saturate levels. The sulfur level, you know, continues to go down mm -hmm. and we get this great viscosity index uh, over here. So greater, we... Greater than 120. Yeah, greater yeah. than 120. Mm -hmm. AMSOIL uses group three base oils. 
they're, they're very good base oils and there's different kinds, um, different manufacturers. We use um, group three base oils regularly yes. on some products. The next one, this group four category is only for one material. So it was defined specifically for a material that's used you know, widely by synthetic manufacturers in the synthetic motor oil industry. Yes. And that is polyalpha olefins. So polyalpha olefins are just one category of molecules that are really good for lubrication, great for viscosity index, and really good for oxidation resistance. This does not come out of the ground. This is a chemically synthesized molecule making, making it very pure yes. and very controlled. Uh, it's all chemical reactions to do that. And as a result, that molecule imparts really, really good properties to the lubrication products that are made with that. And then the last one is group five, and these are all defined as synthetic. So a group five is a group of synthetic molecules, synthetic base oil molecules that can range from uh, silicones to esters to fire retardant uh, base oils and a number of base oils you use for very special applications. Yes. And um, they're not included in the others, uh, and there's a lot of specific parameters that define those base oils. Got it. When we Got do it. use um, base oils for sure in this group five area, other synthetic base oils that impart special properties. And that's kind of it in a nutshell for conventional, group yes. one and group two. Now you're down to synthetic three, four, and five. Okay, now I'm gonna flip away from base oils. So now we're off of base oils. Base oils are giving us the thickness we need to separate surfaces, but that doesn't do it all, Gail. That's only part of the story. Mm -hmm. yes. So the, the other part of the story is the chemicals that are put into the motor oil. And I'm gonna start with a basic of just wear protection. And I know your viewers are probably very familiar with ZDDP. Yes. ZDDP is a molecule that's been around for a long time. And ZDDP is representative of a molecule that does an excellent job when the base oils get too thin or you don't have enough base oil there that the ZDDP is going to kick in and ac actually create a sacrificial wear layer on the surface of a metal uh, shaft or bearing or both and then make sure that those little asperities that are sticking up, the micro differences in the surface of the metals, make sure that those asperities don't touch. Because when they touch... They micro weld. They micro weld. Yeah. And it doesn't yeah. look good when you break a micro weld and you, you get all the, so the contaminants going into the yes, oil and the yes. surface degradation. So this is zinc diethylphosphate is yeah. what we're talking about yep, here? Yep, yeah. ZDDP, mm -hmm. uh, people think about it as zinc, and, but these are yep. the real functional molecules, the sulfur and the phosphorus mm -hmm. are the functional molecules that help create that, what's called a tribal film on the surface that yes. keeps those, those uh, surfaces separated when the base oil can't do the job anymore. So we, we formulate with base oils and then we formulate with this anti-wear chemistry. You know, this is a basic one, we use yes. many other ones, but both are important. You can't just have oil, you gotta have the chemistry too. All right, when I talk about that, that uh, layer or that tribal film mm -hmm. that's uh, put on the surface. This is, uh, in, in a nutshell, what it looks like. You get some uh, sulfur deposition initially on the surface so of the metal. Th this would be the bearing shell? Right, this would be a bearing shell yeah. or a shaft right here, representative yes. of that surface. E either side, mm -hmm. all right. Yep. And what we get is a little bit of sulfur enrichment on the surface and then some you know, iron oxide that forms on the surface. As a function of interaction with the steel? Correct, yeah. yep, and, okay. and the chemistry. And then the real layer of protection starts here. And, and this uh, ZDDP tribal film is actually a really hard surface that forms under temperature and pressure on uh, metals and it's anywhere from 10, 50 to 100 nanometers. So we're talking really, really uh, thin surface. Yes. But it is so hard and so effective that it will keep surfaces from micro welding when base oils aren't there or you just don't have enough there. So when the oil drains off, you shut down the engine, the oil drains off, you've stored it for a while. This is still there on right. the surface of the yeah, bearing it's area. It's kind of created a yes. sacrificial layer on there. Yeah. I hear guys say, we've got additives that actually penetrate the crankshaft, mm -hmm. you know, penetrate into the steel. 
I don't see that. Yeah, and is that, that is that BS or or is that truth? This appears to be on the surface, not in the surface. Yeah, well, this has been proven for many, many years yes. to be very effective at separating surfaces. You have to take a look at whatever claim somebody's making with an additive. Some of them are very fugitive. They go on a surface and mm -hmm. then they scrape away very easily. You have to look at each one and, and the claims and you know what. It, I only go by facts. I'm a facts-based guy. I'm so. with you. I deal in <laughs> That's facts. That's all I care about. Yeah. Yep, I know you do. Just the facts, ma'am. Now I'm going to switch back to the, remember we talked about saturate levels. Yes. And that was on our table back there and we were talking about you want your molecule very saturated so it protects from oxygen attaching on to the backbone of that molecule. Yes. So this is just some basics in, in chemistry. Uh, I happen to like chemistry. Uh, I know some people don't like chemistry, but now you can go tell everybody, this is what a saturated molecule looks like for, <laughs> gotcha. your, for your viewers. So this is just an example of uh, a carbon, you know, a very basic example of a carbon backbone. This is a single molecule carbon, and then it's, it wants to attach to hydrogen and there's four spots to attach on. Yes. And this is a methane gas, but it's a hydrocarbon gas. And it's an it's example of a saturated molecule. This is saturated with hydrogen. So if you had uh, this gone, there would be more room to come in and have something attack that molecule yes. and attach on. Yes. So here's an example of um, what's you know, called a free radical molecule. So this had an, a hydrogen molecule cleaved off, so it's gone. Now, there's an opening here where oxygen can come in and attach on there and once the oxygen attaches on there the backbone gets heavier and heavier and more gets attached and then pretty soon the viscosity goes up and that's a precursor to sludge all right here's some examples of actual molecules that you know you might see uh, in a, a motor oil a motor oil a base oil for motor oil so this would be like a, a normal paraffin straight chain. I know paraffin sounds like wax, but it's just a term in chemistry that's yes. used for a straight chain carbon molecule. And this is an isoparaffin, so it's just a uh, branched uh, hydrocarbon that's pretty much saturated uh, and it just branches off and it has a little bit, you know, different properties. So those are just a couple examples of, you know, a, a kind of saturated molecule. This is a, a, a different structure. This is a, a naphthene and uh, naphthenes are used um, you know, in, not in motor oils really, but they're used in other lubrication applications. And it's, it's an example of a structure that's um, fully saturated, so we've got hydrogens all the way around there. Yes. And so it's very stable. Um, it's got some good properties and some not, not so good properties. And um, because it doesn't have good properties for motor oil. We don't use it in motor oil. Looks like it's got an oxidation opportunity right there. Yeah, so um, good, good question. Molecules, and, and we looked at the saturate level, above 90%. 90% doesn't mean 100%. And 95% doesn't mean 100%. Yes. So there always are little pieces of the molecule where uh, something was cleaved off or we didn't get a hydrogen attached to that. Yes. And then it's susceptible and open this would be where oxidation would start on it. And there's no molecules out there where oxidation doesn't eventually take hold and get us. It's just degrees. It's just better ones. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, so here's an example of an unsaturated molecule. So this is bad. Mm -hmm. This one leaves a lot of room for attack of oxygen uh, onto the base uh, or the backbone of it. So we're gonna introduce some of this chemistry stuff. This is a double bond. Mm -hmm. So this carbon can only have four attachments. So there's two of them here, one there and one there. Mm -hmm. So we can't get another hydrogen on here. Because double bonds are really strong, it changes the characteristics of the attachment of the other molecules, mm -hmm. making this generally kind of unstable. So it wants to react with things. And of course, oxygen would be one it would love to react with. Yes. Come, bring it on, yeah, oxygen. Yeah, yeah. And then it's gonna get in and attach onto that surface because of the strength of this bond and, and then you know what that double bond does because it doesn't have good blockers out here. Yes. We need more hydrogen blockers. Yes, got it. All right, now I'm gonna switch and talk about a very special base oil. I hope oil. you guys are ready for this. <laughs> this is a big one. <laughs> yeah. So this was the, the group four base oils that we talked about. So they, they made a whole category, group four, just special for 
poly-alpha olefins. Mm -hmm. Because they're so good in terms of uh, their molecule characteristics uh, and the properties that they impart you know, for motor oils and then a number of different other lubrication products. So this is a pretty complicated structure here. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, Gail, yeah. but what the big thing is, is we're looking at, we've got saturated molecules all over the place. They got uh, three hydrogens and an attachment to another hydrocarbon. Yes. So the way these are designed, they have excellent flow properties. That viscosity index is tremendous. So they're, they're very thick at high temperatures, and then they, at cold temperatures, they don't thicken up that much. Yes. So they, we're gonna see that today too, how well these types of molecules flow at extremely low temperatures. Yes. That's one of the, the big benefits of this besides the oxidation resistance. So the one thing uh, I wanted to point out here, this is a standard polyalpha olefin, you know, that's used in the industry. Yes. Uh, and this is one that uh, uses a metallocene catalyst to create the molecule. So it's a little different way of creating the molecule and it cleans up some of the sites on the molecule. So it's got uh, slightly different foam properties and some different viscosity index properties. Uh, and a number of things that we really like. So yes. just two examples of that group four fully synthetic. And this is chemistry, you Only. know. Yeah, yes. it's, it's synthetically It didn't reacted, come out of the ground. Did not come out of the ground. Right. And this is a very clean molecule. So what specifically is an olefin? Yeah, so it sounds like a fancy name, Gail. It is a it? fancy it, name. Yeah, it must <laughs> yeah. mean something very specific. Yeah. It's just a chemical name that talks about a specific uh, structure of a hydrocarbon. So it's, it's nothing more than that, but yes. um, it's, it's the, the basically how the backbone is structured and put together. And it's just olefins. They start with a linear alpha olefin, and then you, you branch it and react it and goes to a poly alpha olefin, just meaning a lot of olefins a together. Of, you've just said something about a specific usage of the metallocene material. Yeah, the metallocene materials are, are newer, um, and they're, uh, the industry wants to go to metallocene uh, materials because it's, it's a, a very cost-effective way of making polyalpha olefins. But the benefits that come with that is it improves uh, properties specific to like foaming yes. uh, and uh, viscosity index and other things. So it's an improvement on the standard polyalpha yes. olefin, uh, and so this would be version 2, 2.0 yes. of polyalpha olefins. Thank you. Soot particles, guys. Hey, deleters, smoke boys. We're going to talk about soot. Good intro, because soot is not good in motor oil. Yeah. And so we put specific materials in there for your, your guys that blow soot through their rings into yeah, their motor exactly. oil sump to encapsulate those materials so they don't aggregate. So the message here is if it's coming out the pipe, it's going past the rings. Not good. Please continue. <laughs> well, it, it's a great point. And uh, soot used to be so prevalent uh, in diesel applications yes. that diesel oils were designed and their specific tests to encapsulate soot particles to keep them from aggregating. Because as they get bigger uh, and they want to agglomerate together, then they're going to go into one of those, um, you know, entry to a, a rolling surface, yes. and then scratch and abrade that surface. So you'll, it'll actually uh, create wear. So it is hard on the bearings. Got it. Many engine rebuild on a diesel side was as as a result of soot particles aggregating. Basics of dispersants. You got a, a polar head. So this is the, the head of the chemistry, and it wants, it has an affinity for metals. Yes. So it wants to go seek out metals and attach onto metals. Mm -hmm. So that's what we want um, them to start off doing. Or it's gonna also have an affinity to a soot particle. So this polar head is gonna go in and attach onto the surface of the soot particle. And the tail, here's the functionality of the tail. Yes. The, the tail likes oil. So the, the tail is gonna sit out this way and attach itself to the oil and the head is going to keep attached to the soot particle thus separating the soot particle from other soot particles exactly. and, and keeping them separated so yes. these are blockers again they're blocking another soot particle from coming in and then these would be going after the other soot particle how does the polar head attach 
Yeah, it's basically an, an attraction. That's a good question, yes. Gail. So that polar head is positively charged, mm -hmm. and it's being attracted onto the negatively charged surface of the soot particle. Got it. So then it wants to just grab on and stay there based on kind the of charge. sounds like magnetism. Yeah. All right, this is a, a, a look at a detergent molecule. So dispersants, we talked about, keeps uh, contaminants uh, from aggregating yep. and keeps them uh, encapsulated. Yep. Now we're talking about some cleaning here. Yes. So the, 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 um, the detergent molecule has a couple different properties. Number one, it's gonna help clean surfaces. Mm -hmm. So it keeps surfaces free of varnish and, and buildup of carbon, you know, yes. those types of things. Yes. Additionally, and this is very important for your diesel audience here and people that own diesel vehicles, is this has got calcium carbonate in the core of the molecule. And calcium carbonates like Tums. So yes. Tums neutralize a bad stomach acid. So the, yeah. this calcium carbonate or some other uh, materials in there that act like Tums, they'll actually absorb those acids that are created in the combustion process. Yes. And for the diesel combustion process, we create a lot of acids Absolutely. in the combustion of that, yes. that fuel. Yes. So this material in the center then is going to neutralize those acids and keep them from building up. If you get too much acid buildup, mm -hmm. it eats up the lining in your stomach. You get too much acid buildup in your motor oil sump, yes. it's going to eat up bearings. And it's going to start with yellow metals, soft surfaces and mm -hmm. yellow metals. Mm -hmm. That's a place where it's going to show up first. If you're eating, if you get to the point of too much acid buildup and it starts to eat the surface of the bearing, you can go, oh, I've got a lot of time to react. You actually don't. Yes. When it starts eating away, you're, you're in trouble. To you're toast. Yeah, you're toast. Yeah. So again, this is what it looks like, the polar head of the molecule seeking out the uh, surface of the iron and then attaching to that iron. And then we're keeping that surface clean more surface chemistry yes, here. Yes, yes, so yes. we got a whole bunch of things moving to the surface and wanting to do inhibitor. things. We always see water. Water's all around us. It's in the atmosphere. We're getting condensation constantly yes. in a motor oil sump. So you can't run from water. So the, the only thing you can do is to protect yourself from the water buildup in, in sumps. So the way that we do that, and, and also people think, well, oils all protect surfaces of metal, right? 100%, if you just put any oil yeah, you on just the smear surface, it on there. Yeah. yeah, it's gonna protect yeah. the surface. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not the case, uh, because those surfaces uh, are very fugitive, and uh, water can get in in a hurry. Yes. So you actually have to get down to the molecular level to protect your surfaces from rust. So this, again, is the same type of molecule, polar head attaching to the surface, and then the tail sticking out here actually repels the the water from coming in and, and attaching and attacking that surface. So again, there's a lot of surface chemistry going on mm -hmm. here. Don't be an amateur chemist. Let us do that work and we'll keep, uh, we'll keep your diesel vehicle running a lot longer. So I think what Dan's talking about is combination. When you're designing an engine, there's a combination of valve timing and port size and rod length and stroke length the right combination in an engine makes it durable and makes it win. The right combination in the oil does the same thing. So what Dan's saying is don't screw with the combination by pouring other stuff in to the crankcase. Yeah, it was meticulously designed based on knowledgeable people mm -hmm. that, that know the chemistry for and what you described in terms of a build of an engine. Yes. That engine builder was meticulous in the way they design clearances, the materials that mm -hmm. are used in the piston and the piston rings. All, all part of the combination. All part, yeah, and, yeah. and we spend so much time on that. We also spend the same amount of time on building the lubrication package for that mm -hmm. because it's important. Yes. All right, Gail, we talked about a lot of the chemistry that goes in, the components that go yes. in that build the, the functionality of the fluid. Now we're going to take a step back and just talk in general about how do you build a 5W30? So, Go for it. So, so what, how <laughs> yeah. do you build it? Yes. So we're going to break that up into two components. First of all, we're going to start off with the W rating. People think about W rating as cold. So that's the rating for how the oil functions in cold temperatures. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's a 5W rating. What that means for thickness of the oil and just on the viscosity side, mm -hmm. it's a maximum of 6,600 centipoise 
at a temperature of minus 30 C. Yes. So that is the highest in thickness it can be in terms of centipoise, and that's like stirring a cake, yes. where we're trying to stir through that oil, that yes. method of measurement. So it can't be more than 6,600. So that's cold flow. Right, cold flow, which is important. We talked about for cold starts on engines. Yes. It's really important. That's it, why it's there. Does this mean in the base stock that the oil is inherently five weight, and then you add to it? with friction modifier? Good, good question. Yeah. I'm, we're gonna cover that one next okay. after we finish up on here. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk right. about it. So that's the 5W, cold temperature, very important. Now we're gonna talk, what does the 30 mean? Because yes. it actually is a separate. So maybe people have looked at a 5W30 for years mm -hmm. and they don't understand you know, the difference. It's two distinct things. So now for a 30 weight, for the 30 component of a yes. 5W30, you must be between 9.3 and 12.5, and this is in centistoke, so it's a different measurement of viscosity. Yes. And this one is attempting to replicate engine temperatures. So it's up at 212 degrees F or exactly. 100 degrees C. 100 C or 212 seems too low. How do you lo look at an oil beyond that temperature? Well, that's a good point, Gail. And, and you know, is, is a it, synthetic better? It, it actually yes. is, yeah. So this is an industry standard. It's set, you know, it's a SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers, sets the standard. So it's the standard that everybody uses to measure against. Of course, we do testing at much higher temperatures mm -hmm. than this because we know applications run much higher than that. So we do a, a, a fair amount of work uh, in that area. Now, you, you asked a question about synthetics. What's, what's the difference between synthetic and conventional in terms of formulating a 5 weight exactly. 30. Do you start with a 5 weight and add st stuff to make it a 30 on the other end, or how does that work? Yeah, so that's a really good question, and, and it's one that's very important, I think, for the viewers to understand, you know, especially if they're considering you know, buying a synthetic over a conventional, if they've been on conventional oils for a long time. The way that you do this uh, on a conventional oil is Conventional oils are naturally kind of thick, especially at cold temperatures. They contain some waxes. Okay. So what people do, they would never make this 5W rating at cold temperatures with that conventional oil that contain the waxes. So they actually ah. formulate with a much lower thickness oil. So maybe a 20 weight? Yeah, like down to what you would use on a 20 weight oil. Mm -hmm. And then to build it back up, so that it makes this measurement at high temperatures, yep. they add a viscosity improver or a viscosity modifier. Got it. And what that does, it acts like an octopus. So at hot temperatures, this viscosity modifier grows and, gr and creates tentacles and is, uh, makes itself seem thicker. Yes. And then at cold temperatures, on the other side, it contracts back down. So, so it, it doesn't would, increase the thickness. So it would take your 20 base stock to five? It would take actually the 20 base stock up to a 30 base stock. Right. And, and create that thickness. What about the cold flow? Yeah, while still meeting the 5W rating on the cold flow because that viscosity um, uh, modifier contracts at cold temperatures. Got so it, it, it got doesn't it. impart thickness. Oh. It's a difficult concept to understand, but it's very important. This viscosity improver or modifier, how long does it last? That's another good question. You're, Does it you're, shear down real quick? You're a good student. Oh, thank Gail. you. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens? What Gail's talking about it in implying, viscosity modifiers and improvers are complex chemicals, mm -hmm. and they don't last forever. Yes. So they're subject to shear. Yes. So as you're shearing things up and running around in your oil pump and going through the engine, it's cleaving the molecule of that viscosity improver or modifier. So pretty soon, it starts to lose some thickness. So up here, um, it started at a 30 weight, it starts to go down, and then pretty soon it gets into a 20 weight category because we're chopping that molecule up. Yes. So it can't impart the thickness improvement that it originally did. So every time you put a few more hard hours on the lube package, you start out at 5W30, then it becomes 5W29, then 5W28, it's just shearing down to that 20 weight base stock. And it means Audio less engine film percent. strength. Yeah, film yeah. strength starts to go. Yep. All right, so now we're gonna take this concept and we're gonna put it into use in an actual motor oil life graph. Before we go there, 
if you go to synthetic, do you need as much viscosity improver? Yeah, good question. So generally, we talked about viscosity index, meaning that it maintains the viscosity at hot temperatures and it doesn't get so thick at cold temperatures. Yes. So synthetics are inherently much better for the viscosity index, so we sparingly use viscosity modifiers. When we use one, we use a really expensive one that is very resistant to shear, yes. but we don't need to, to use near the amount that a conventional base oil manufacturer would have to use. This sounds like part of the advantage of synthetic product. It is, it's yeah. a big part of the advantage. Got it. It's kind of an, a thing that Life you didn't expectancy. need to add yeah. Yeah. in the first place. Yeah. What about viscosity improvers or modifiers above 100 C? So what happens is we started off building this 30 weight with lower viscosity base oils, yes. and then we built it back up with a viscosity modifier. So yes. that's how a conventional manufacturer would do it. Yes. As a result, when you get way up above 100 degrees C, you've got lighter fractions mm -hmm. of base oil in the conventional product. Yes. Those have a tendency to boil off, kind of like water. So what happens is those light fractions boil off, and yes. your oil sump is going to start to come down because those fractions are gone. This is another way of using oil. Yeah, another way of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not going past the rings. It's not it's, burning the oil. Yeah, it's, it's vaporizing. It's vaporizing, and, yeah, yeah, and coming out. So it's go, going out in the blow by mm -hmm. and being consumed by the engine's right, combustion and, process. Yeah, and you might have a nasty looking EGR valve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So sounds like the synthetic product doesn't do that. Yeah, it, it, the VM is something that's... It's not as volatile. Yeah, it, if you don't have to add the VM, you don't want to add that. So a synthetic yeah. product with no to very little VM added, um, it's um, much more uh, naturally stable. It's not going to volatize yes. you know, like a conventional product would. So now we're going to talk, uh, sum it up here with a motor oil life graph. Now, Gail, this is a proprietary test developed by Amsoil to simulate long duration oil service and development of sludge forming properties. What are the units here? Yeah, this is viscosity on the y-axis and then just and, time and on the x-axis. In what units? Yeah, this would be in centistokes okay. up, up here All right. the motor oil life. All right, so we're gonna uh, put a couple curves on here first or some limits. So we, we just talked about what you have to do to meet a 30 weight, mm -hmm. you know, between, uh, you know, that 9.3 and 12.5 up so here. There we are right yep, there. So right, yeah. this is critical limits that we want to stay in because yes. this is, uh, the oil is designed for applications that require a 30 weight. Now we're going to overlay a product on here, Dale. Gotcha. So here's a, a good product in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. We're going to start off uh, right in the middle of the viscosity range here. It looks like we're doing, you know, really well. Yes. So when this is the brand new oil that's clean, uh, hasn't been run yet, we're starting right in the middle of that 30 weight. Now look what's happening fairly uh, short amount of time in. It's well, starting it's, to drop. It's actually 20 weight. Yeah, it popped out of it's, the lower it's limit below for 30, the 30 weight. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So it, it's dropped below there for a period of time, and this is because of shear. So the oil is being sheared in this application and being beat up quite a bit, mm -hmm. uh, and it, so it dropped a little bit below a 30 weight. And now at this point over here, you can see we're starting to come back up in thickness. So what's going on there, Gail? I think it's starting to oxidize, I think. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's oxidation taking hold right there. So as oxidation starts to take hold, the thickness of our oil goes up, uh, up and up, and um, not far behind oxidation is always sludge formation. Yes. So anytime you see an increase in viscosity like this, you're getting sludge very quickly after that. This, but, is, this is shocking to me. Yeah, this is something that we really pay attention to. So yes. we're going to overlay an Amsoil product on here. When we say it's a 30 weight, it's a 30 weight over the life of the oil. So here's another product, Gail, very good product in the marketplace. Yep. This one following the same curve, mm -hmm. starting off uh, right in around the middle of a 30 weight range. Again, it's dropping below a 30 weight, and then it starts to come up again. And uh, it's increasing they, they in both, viscosity again. They both break out at the same point. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And um, So where's the advantage here? 
Well, right here, this Delta up here, we're, we're talking about this is the advantage. So it's an extended performance product. It. So it has re resistance to oxidation. So it, this is an accelerated laboratory test that's yes. predicting motor oil life. So we're seeing the Delta between the extended performance product and the standard product in terms of viscosity increase. So that, you know, it's a, a good Delta there. And now we're going to overlay an AMSOIL product on here. So I want to point out two things, Gail, with the AMSOIL product. Yes. So we're the green line here. Look at where we go. We go down a little bit towards the, the low end of the 30 weight range, but we stay in grade yes. for a 30 weight in this accelerated test, which is important because if AMSOIL says they do something, we do it. If we say it's going to stay in range, it's going to stay in range, and that's, that's how we build things. Now we start to, at the same point that the other products started to have these very large increases in viscosity. Our product is really kind of flat. Their oxidation rate is much lower. That's what this portion of the graph is showing. Yeah. Where the delta here is huge in terms of the uh, formation of you know, heavy uh, backbone uh, oxygen attaching uh, heavily to the backbone you know, compared to this one. So sludge formation is put off a long, long ways with the SIG series product compared to you know, a product that, that doesn't perform as well. So the oil is getting thicker here. Right, actually getting thicker. And the rate of thickness uh, increase is directly proportional to sludge formation. So what's happening, even though it's thicker, uh, I don't think it's l lubricating as well. Right, you, you start so, to get up into this range where the oil's getting really thick. Yes. It doesn't act like a brand new oil that's that thick because it's got a whole bunch of oxygen attached to it. Uh, some, some contaminants are getting in there. Yep. So it doesn't have the natural lubricity so of a brand new oil. So its parasitic loss would go up. Yeah, yep. yeah you're going to lose horsepower and fuel economy and, for sure with that. And, and, and that's and important. And compromised lubrication. Right, all three. Yeah. Yep. That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah, that's a nice yeah. curve there. We're pretty proud of that one. <laughs> what a remarkable difference. Yeah. This is how we're formulating and the results of formulation and formulation chemistry, Gail. Now we're going to take uh, you through the laboratory and show you all of the instruments that we use to test a fully formulated motor oil. So that'll be our next segment. That's our next step. All right.